It's November 7th, 1860, and Lincoln has won the election. So of course you know this means war. But wait, does it? When do we start the actual shooting? I'm Kotal, and welcome to my channel where I explore political, diplomatic, and military history. This video is the first in a series that will trace the development of events from Lincoln's election to the surrender of Fort Sumter several months later, initiating the U.S. Civil War. It will trace the course of the crisis as it develops week by week. Election Day in 1860 occurred on Tuesday, November the 6th, with Lincoln winning against a divided field with 180 of the necessary 152 electoral votes, but with only approximately 40% of the popular vote. His support came exclusively from northern states, and in fact he did not appear on the ballot in several southern states, such as South Carolina. Word of the election results spread rapidly thanks to the introduction of a new technology, the telegraph. In this episode, we'll explore the reactions to this event in week one, the 7th through 13th of November, on the road to the Civil War. Wednesday, November 7th. Celebrating Lincoln's victory, the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote in his diary, Lincoln is elected. Overwhelming majorities in New York and Pennsylvania. This is a great victory. One can hardly overrate its importance. It is the redemption of the country. Freedom is triumphant. Thursday, November 8th. The reaction was equally intense for many in South Carolina. Resident Mary Chestnut wrote in her diary, yesterday on the train, a woman called out, that settles the hash. The excitement was very great. Everybody was talking at the same time. One, a little more moved than the others, stood up and said despondently, the die is cast. No more vain regrets. Sad forebodings are useless. The stake is life or death. Did you ever, was the prevailing exclamation. And someone cried out, now that the black radical Republicans have the power, I suppose they will brown us all. No doubt of it. According to the editors of Chestnut's Diary, this reference to Brown is to John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry the year prior. Namely, that the intent would be for northern abolitionists to agitate for a servile rebellion and lead massacres against the white southern population. However, another explanation for this word choice can be found in the following anecdote from James McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom. The election of Lincoln, declared an Alabama newspaper, shows that the North intends to free the expletive and force amalgamation between them and the children of the poor men of the South. If you are tame enough to submit, declaimed South Carolina's Baptist clergyman James Furman, abolition preachers will be at hand to consummate the marriage of your daughters to black husbands. While the former explanation appears more likely due to the context, the latter reaction to the prospect of miscegenation displays a present undercurrent within the discourse surrounding secession at the time. Friday, November 9th. To try and resolve the crisis, President Buchanan convened his cabinet to discuss possible solutions. Several proposals were made, but no consensus was reached. Four broad policy stances were suggested by the various members of the cabinet endorsing various proposals. These approaches can be broken down into four general categories. First, and the most hawkish, Secretary of State Lewis Cass from Michigan, supported by Attorney General Jeremiah Sullivan Black from Pennsylvania, proposed preserving the Union even if it meant military intervention. Second, President Buchanan from Pennsylvania, supported by the Secretary of the Navy, proposed a convention of the states be declared to settle the issue in a conciliatory gesture. Third, the Secretary of War John Floyd from Virginia opposed secession as unnecessary as did Postmaster General Joseph Holt from Kentucky. But he also opposed Buchanan's proposal for a convention of the states. Fourth, Secretary of the Treasury Howell Cobb from Georgia endorsed secession and was joined by Secretary of the Interior Jacob Thompson from Mississippi, who argued that any show of force to prevent South Carolina's secession would induce his state to exit as well. Saturday, November 10th. Both of South Carolina's Senators, James Chestnut and James Hammond, resign their seats. Meanwhile, the South Carolina Legislature orders a convention to meet in Columbia on December the 17th to decide whether or not the state should remain in the Union. 
Observing these developments, former President John Tyler wrote to his son about the ongoing situation. So all is over, and Lincoln elected. South Carolina will secede. What other states will do remains to be seen. Virginia will abide the developments. Meanwhile, Jefferson Davis, at the time the senator from Mississippi, discussed the issue of secession in correspondence with the South Carolinian politician Robert Rett. After mentioning the logistics of the upcoming convention to address this question, he intimates, if South Carolina should first secede, and she alone should take such action, the position of Mississippi would not probably be changed by that fact. A powerful obstacle to the separate action of Mississippi is a want of a port, from which follows the consequence that her trade being still conducted through the ports of the Union. He followed up advising the best course of action for South Carolina was to build as wide a coalition as possible among the southern states and speculated on the likely courses of action in response available to the federal government. If the secession of South Carolina should be followed by an attempt to coerce her back into the Union, that act would enlist every true Southern man for her defense. If it were attempted to blockade her ports and destroy her trade, a like result would be produced, and the commercial world would probably be added to her allies. He further noted what he argued was the logic for forming what would become the CSA. The planting states have a common interest of such magnitude that their union, sooner or later, for the protection of that interest, is certain. In nearby Louisiana, William T. Sherman, at the time a superintendent of a military academy, wrote of the ramification of Lincoln's election to his wife Ellen. In that letter, he discussed his political affinity, although he did not vote in that election himself. I would have preferred Bell, but I think he has no chance and I do not wish to be the subject to any political conditions. He noted a fear of recriminations if he voted under the assumption that he supported Lincoln. He continued with concerns for the implications. No matter which way we turn, there arise difficulties which seem insurmountable. In case Lincoln is elected, they say that South Carolina will secede, and that the southern states will not see their force back. Secession must result in civil war anarchy, and ruin to our present form of government. Monday, November 12th. Fear that the president-elect may be assassinated was on the minds of some, such as one Dr. Carter who took the step to write Lincoln, warning him to be wary. Though personally a stranger to you, I wish to make one suggestion. That is, be careful that your enemies do not administer poison to you. They feel desperate, and I fear they will resort to desperate measures. Meanwhile, concerns grew in Charleston over potential danger to the federal arsenal in the city. However, the commander's concerns were over the security of the facility against threats from a servile rebellion and considered the city and state officials as allies against this imminent threat. He wired to his senior officer in the War Department, Sir, in view of the excitement now existing in this city and state and the possibility of an insurrectionary movement on the part of the servile population, the governor has tendered through the South Carolina militia, a guard of a detachment of a lieutenant and 20 men for this post, which has been accepted. Tuesday, November 13th. Within one week of the election, the raising of military formations had begun. The South Carolinian legislature authorized the raising of 10,000 men for the state's defense. James Pettigrew, a unionist South Carolinian, wrote to his sister Jane, bemoaning the rush to secession. It is sorrowful to see things that impair our respect for our countrymen, and nothing can be more efficient to produce that feeling than the scenes that are passing. It is barely possible that Georgia may recoil from the action that the secessionists are driving to. Within the first week after Lincoln's election, many already viewed secession and war as inevitable. The executive branch appeared paralyzed to provide a unified answer to the crisis as South Carolina took increasing steps to separate itself from the Union, from the resignation of its senators to the raising of a militia, and most of all, setting a date for a state convention to decide the question of leaving the Union. Yet, so far after one week, civil war had not yet erupted across America, despite Lincoln's election. The Union had not yet been sundered. 
in the next episode covering week 2, November 14th through the 20th, the actions reverberate as far as the frontier and the base rage across the southern state capitals on the best course of action. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting the channel through the like and subscribe buttons. Please let me know what you thought of my rendition in the comments, including any things you found surprising or important elements which I should have included or that I mischaracterized. Thank you for your support, and I look forward to seeing you next time.